And we're back. One more episode of... The Horror Guys. Yay! Yay. Episode 280 of The Horror Guys. That's a lot of horror movies. Yeah, where we're going to talk about horror movies. And this week, instead of a short, we have a comic book to we discuss do. that we're going to, that we reviewed. As our cat goes crazy in the background. Yeah, disregard that. <laughs> She's wanting attention this morning. What do we got? Oh, I, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, we have Godzilla minus one from 2020. Finally, yeah, yeah, we saw that, and a very new and very weird stop motion from 2024, and like we mentioned, a comic book called Hemlock Avenue, and a fine movie from 2020, Ghosts of War, and Low Lifes, another brand new one, and. A couple bonus movies that we're not going to fully discuss are The Human Monster from 1939 and The Leech Woman from 1960. Yeah, if you want to have a, hear about the oldies, you've got to be on our weekly newsletter at horrorbulletin.com. Mm -hmm. Sign up now. It's totally free, 100% completely free. No tricks, no, no nothing. One email a week with all our reviews in it. Just read it like a... Well, it's a newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> it's and got the, all the reviews right there in your email box and once those a week. Two bonus movies were pretty good ones this week. But you yeah. can, but you can read all about it. You know, I remember seeing the Leech Woman when I was like four. Oh okay. I remember that one. I had never seen either of these before, the human monster or the leech woman. I had not seen the human monster before, I don't believe. Hmm. Bella Lugosi in that one. Yes. Yeah. As a he wasn't blind. Was well, okay. He was playing yeah. a blind man and yeah. sort of. Playing. Okay, that's in spoiler territory. Oh, spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He played multiple characters. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and that's uh, the newsletter, and that's the website, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as we've been mentioning over the past nine or ten weeks, we do offer a free book every week. This week we've got a weird one. It's not about horror at all, unless you're experiencing one. It's about wildfires. 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 The 10 worst wildfires in history and what you need to know about fires and fire prevention. Mm-hmm. It's kind of inter interesting. Interesting yeah. stuff. Nothing whatsoever to do with horror movies, but <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll, we'll plug it because it's us. Mm-hmm. All right. Where are we going to start? We're going to start with Godzilla Minus One that, that you're mostly going to read because it's a bunch of Asian names and I struggle with those more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> This is a Japanese movie, and it's almost entirely Japanese folks that were in the making of it, and the actors in it, and so uh, yeah, it was a low budget movie that they made last year. They it, gave very limited release in the states because they figured so nobody was going to want to see good. it. It's my favorite of all the Godzillas that I've seen, the the modern ones, the old ones, the yeah, the all of them. Yeah, I would have. This, I like it, Shin Godzilla a lot too. If you if you like Shin Godzilla, this is in the same flavor. You know, more realistic, less silly. But this, is, I think, this has even better elements to it. Yeah, this is Shin Godzilla. got a lot more dramatic stuff yeah, to it. Yeah, they they kept the retro feel of the old Godzilla movies, but modernized it and made it so much better. I liked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easily, in my opinion, and yours, the best Godzilla movie. Yeah. And where can you get it? Nowhere, because... Well, nowhere. Because they, they kind of dropped the ball because they weren't expecting it to be that popular. It's going to come to streaming in the U.S. later in the year, like October. Isn't I've it? heard uh, an uh, October heard. release. and Yeah, yeah it, it's... it played bl briefly at theaters and was much more popular than expected, and it's getting real good word of mouth. They're really dragging their feet You'll on go this to one. watch it online, and where are you going to do that? Hmm. Yar. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. We were reading the other day that it's the most pirated movie. It is. Yeah, currently. Yeah. Because if you want to see it, there's no other options. We've seen like three yeah. movies in the movie theater since COVID. That was one of them. Avatar 2, Dune 2, and Godzilla Minus 1. Mm -hmm. All three of them are worth it. Yes. Actually, if one of those was least... I would probably say Dune 2 was the least impressive of the three visually. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, Godzilla 1, minus 1, directed by Takashi Yamazaki, written by Ishiro Honda, Takeo Murata, Takashi Yamazaki, stars Manami Hamabe, Hamabe Sakura Endo, and Ryosuke Kamiki, 
two hours and four minutes. So it's actually kind of long for a Godzilla movie. Totally worth it. Spoiler free, what happens? Spoiler free, there's a big Godzilla daikaiju. No. Yeah. Well, this movie does a great job of showing the look and feel of post-World War II Japan. And it deals a lot with the rebuilding and the guilt and patriotism of that era from the Japanese point of view. Godzilla is very powerful here and a straight-up monster without sympathy. The effects, direction, and story are all really good, and we give it a big thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these movies, you don't need to know any history or anything like that. This one, it helps if you know a little bit about the war, the uh, World War II history and J the J Japanese side of things and how that went for them and why it went that way for them. Mm -hmm. They're very resentful for losing the war. They're not resentful against the United States for bit winning. They're resentful against their own leadership for putting them in this position. Yeah, there was a lot of resentment and anger, and yeah, the 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 after the after war, you know, this this delves into the realizing like, hey, that emperor really screwed us. PTSD <laughs> and uh, survivors' guilt and all kind of dramatic stuff in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, hey, there's a monster too. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah, and they fit it so nicely together. I've heard some people say this is boring. I I didn't think so at all. If you, I think yeah. if you understand the history, it is not in the least bit boring. But if you're looking for just, you know, Godzilla versus Kong, it's not like that. It's not like the modern ones where they just scream at your eyes for two hours with giant monsters fighting each other. Yeah, I, th I think basically that's it. The, the, the main Godzilla series right now, you got Godzilla versus Kong, the new empire, and that whole King Kong Godzilla series since like 2014. Mm -hmm. It's as much silliness as it is monsters. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's high, a high lot action. like Transformers, yeah. only with... Only monsters, yeah. the kaijus instead. Yeah. Th th they're fun, they're good action movies, but they're dumb. Mm -hmm. This is not like that. Yeah. So you got their... their you know, okay. Real, well, pe real people in it that you care about. And, yeah. yeah. We open on a plane flying toward a small island. The plane lands on a dirt runway, and we see that the plane has a great big bomb affixed to the bottom. But it's not the kind of bomb that gets dropped. It's 1945 at the Odo Island airfield, and the mechanics look over Koichi's plane and say there's nothing wrong with it. Koichi is a kamikaze pilot, and it looks to everyone as if he's landed there out of cowardice. Yeah, you faked having uh, something wrong with my plane. I can't do this mission. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. I got a headache. Yeah. <laughs> the head mechanic is on Koichi's side, but Koichi feels like a failure. Koichi sits around and he sulks on the beach, noticing all the dead fish floating around. Uh-oh. That night, the air raid siren starts screaming, something big is coming. The men all hear a roar, and then they see it. A giant lizard thing as big as a dinosaur. It's not huge, but it's, it's big enough to tear down buildings. Oh, yeah. The men say, that's what killed all the deep sea fish. It's a thing called Godzilla. How they know that, I don't know. Just local legends, I guess. Yeah, I think so. The mechanic asks Koichi to get into his plane and shoot the thing, as they have no effective weapons. Yeah, they've got little guns that are just bouncing off the hide, but the, the plane has a super big... Um, the machine gun Yeah, guns, the machine yeah. guns, yeah. Koichi runs to his plane, but he freezes in cowardice before shooting. The monster then kills all the mechanics. In the morning, Koichi finds all the corpses lined up. Tachibana, the head mechanic, did survive, and he blames Koichi for not saving them. Well, okay, time passes and the war is now over. We cut to a ship full of soldiers returning home to Japan, and Koichi is one of them. He gets a letter stating that his family has been killed in the bombings. The neighbor lady, Sumiko, asks how Koichi can still be alive, since he was supposed to be a kamikaze pilot. She blames him personally for losing the war. I doubt he did it himself. No, no. Well, we get lots of shots of Japanese people rebuilding and trying to survive in the wreckage. And these are, this is a very low-budget movie, but this one looks very good. Yeah, it does. Yeah, they did a good job with what they had. Koichi encounters a woman being chased for stealing. She hands over her baby to Koichi and then runs away. What's he going to do with a baby in this hellscape? Well, he waits all day for the mother to return, and she finally does come back. She's Noriko, and the baby, Akiko, isn't really hers. She just sort of found it and adopted it. She follows him home, where he starts taking care of her and the baby. 
Neighbor Sumiko says she won't help them, but she soon does anyway, giving Noriko tips on baby care, grumbling about it the whole time. Yeah, she's she's grumbly, but you can tell she's got a heart of gold. Yeah. Yeah. Months pass, and the three are still together. Koichi says he's finally gotten a good-paying job, and it's only just a little dangerous, clearing out old mines from the ocean. Well, she doesn't want him to die, but the money will be food for the baby. He says it's not so bad, really. He'll be on a special boat built to avoid the mines. <laughs> and you're picturing this high-tech mine sweeper thing. No, no, turns out. <laughs> turns out that special boat is just an old wooden fishing boat, and it's really old and rickety. It looks like it could sink at any time. <laughs> but that's what they need because the mines are magnetic. Yeah, it won't and attach the, to and the... the boat is all wood. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Koichi meets his three co-workers. Noda, Doc, is the smart one. He says he developed naval weapons during the war. The boat captain is Akitsu, and the third guy is young Mizushima, the kid, who regrets that he was too young to fight in the war. From what I've heard of the, the situation over there, he doesn't look too young to have fought in the war. They were getting pretty desperate they toward were, the end yeah. of recruiting really young folks. Yeah. Well, he didn't anyway. Akitsu explains how the mines are captured with a cable and then detonated by shooting at them. Yeah, they got a pretty good system. That seems pretty reasonable, yeah, really. Yeah, a really good system set up for doing that. At night, Koichi still has nightmares about that big monster thing that he saw. He's got pretty severe PTSD from the war, and he wonders if he's even really alive. Is he just dreaming it? No, we're not going there. It's not that kind of movie. No. 1946 arrives, and the United States continues testing nuclear weapons at the Bikini Atolls. Koichi and his co-workers are happy now. Koichi and adopted family are happy also. It's all good. We're looking at a happy ending after the war. And the neighbor is still there. She's she's kind of being a grandmotherly figure to the baby. They've yeah. even managed to rebuild their home. Akiko calls Koichi daddy, but he says that's not really true. But his friends disagree. Mm-hmm. He's doing the job. Well, things continue. It's 1947 now, and Noriko gets an office job. He doesn't want to get married, and she wants to support herself now. If he's not going to marry her, she's got things to do. Yeah, going to move on. Sumiko will watch Akiko while they're at work. We get some newsreels talking about some organism that has been attacking warships in the Pacific. Pacific. Uh-oh. There are no good photos, but we've seen it before. We know what it is. It's predicted to be hit, hit Japan within a week. Due to tensions between the USA and Russians, the American fleet cannot be active in the area. Japan is on its own. And I think that may be the hardest part of the movie to... To believe. Yeah, that wasn't quite right. They, they a man, uh, um, America had conquered Japan. They were bringing boatloads of people over there. They were guarding. They, they were they were probably still picking off stragglers at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it took. A they while were not to clean afraid to be up. in the area because of the Russians. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's, it's Japanese got to handle it themselves. Well, and it, yeah, plot it's, point. And it's a fiction movie. They, Sort of. Not, not, complete, sort of. <laughs> not completely historically accurate. There really wasn't a Godzilla that we know of. That we know, uh-huh. Yeah, they yeah. might have covered it up. Koichi and his friends come upon a shipwreck and wonder what could have been, what could have done this. A whale? A Soviet weapon? Koichi tells the others about Godzilla when he sees deep, dead deep sea fish floating on the surface. Uh-oh. He says it must have grown much bigger since he saw it two years ago. Doc says there's an old Japanese warship that's going to be returned to them to help, if they can just hold out it long enough. The guys capture a couple of sea mines to maybe use as weapons against Godzilla. They spot more dead fish, and Koichi screams that it's coming. He wants to run, but the captain wants to defend Tokyo. Then the monster comes out of nowhere and crushes their sister ship in one bite. Captain says, nope, and they start running. Yeah. (laughs) Godzilla swims after them, and they drop a mine. Koichi has no trouble shooting at it this time, but it doesn't slow down the creature at all. It's much bigger. They drop the second mine, and this time they explode, they detonate it in his mouth. And a big chunk of Godzilla's head blows off, but we see it quickly grow back. It does slow him down, but doesn't stop him. Yeah, it blows on. Yeah, the whole head just yeah, sort of his, his jaw, back. jaw is gone, and yeah, you see it growing back. That's not good. Out of nowhere, the warship arrives, blasting Godzilla with the big guns. They do some damage, and Godzilla dives down deep. Koichi and his friends watch as the battleship explodes in nuclear fire. 
Godzilla has blasted it from below. We don't get to see the nuclear fire yet, but it's there. Yeah, yeah, it is. It roars and then swims away, leaving the little wooden minesweeper alone. Koichi passes out. Well, he awakens in the hospital. No one from the other two ships, ships have survived. Only his three friends remain. He wants to warn Tokyo, but Doc says the government knows all about it, but won't tell the population in order to avoid a stampede. And here's where we get everybody complaining about the government's bad decisions again. Uh-huh. None of them seem happy with it, but they can't do anything about the government's decisions. He tells Noriko that he was a coward during the war, and he still blames himself for the death of all those mechanics. This leads him into the story of encountering Godzilla on the island. Godzilla is spotted just off the coast of Japan, and it has gotten big. Feeding off those nuclear tests, probably. Koichi yeah. hears the air raid sirens going off. There's mass panic as the giant lizard stomps through Ginza. Noriko is on a train that is forced to stop, and she sees it just before it picks up her train. And for, again, I, I will comment for being such a low-budget movie, how impressive the effects were. Yes, looks really good. Yeah. She escapes, but just barely. A news crew on top of the building doesn't fare as well. Yeah, these guys are up on top of a skyscraper looking, you know, eye level to Godzilla. Live. Look at this, look at this, we're so close. And then it knocks the Whoops. building down. <laughs> yeah, too close. Well, Koichi grabs Noriko and pulls her away from Godzilla's huge feet, but his tail wipes out a bunch of buildings. The tanks are right. you got to gotta have little miniature tanks in a Godzilla movie. Oh, of course, yeah. And they start shooting, but that only angers the monster. His tail starts glowing, one segment at a time. This is really cool. Yeah, it is. As he builds up his strength for atomic blast. And in the old ones, you could pretty much tell it was a guy in a rubber suit. Uh-huh. This one is much better looking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it? there were still some suit shots, there, but there it's was, harder to tell. But, but it's a much better effect, yeah. The shock waves wipe out most of the city. It's, I mean, it's like a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. Mushroom cloud and everything. And Noriko is blown away. Koichi is behind a building, and he survives unscathed. With Noriko dead, Koichi takes it personally once again. It's all his fault. Some time passes, and Koichi has a funeral for Akiko's mother, and everyone pitches in to help him with his daughter, which he still doesn't accept, really. Not officially, yeah. Doc tells Koichi that they're developing a strategy to fight Godzilla. Koichi eagerly joins the effort. It's a civilian thing, but there are many military veterans involved. The U.S. government still can't help because of those Russians, those pesky Russians. Right. It's actually all Doc's plan, and he explains to the group that he wants to use scientific principles to make Godzilla sink to the bottom of the ocean, where the pressure will probably kill it. And, I, and I'm going to just throw in a comment, too, that that's a trend that was in the older Godzilla movies, too, and the older Daikaiju movies. Um, you know, the World War II Japan, they, again, altered the history in those, too, I, I remember, some of them. Where the U.S., like, you know, here's post-war Japan, and there's, like, no U.S. involved. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an unconditional surrender with Japan, and the U.S. was very involved. Military lockdown and helping the rebuilding. and Japan had no military whatsoever. Yeah, and yeah. Here, here the U.S. is to be seen nowhere. It's entirely just the Japanese doing it on their own. It's their side of the story. It is, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, uh, as a backup plan, in case that doesn't work, they're going to quickly float Godzilla back up to the surface so the reduction in pressure will finish the job. He goes into a lot of detail about what they're going to try. The group still has a lot of resentment about the government and the war, but the old general makes it clear that there's no other choice. Eventually, the group concludes that eh, eh, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Doc says it's expected to hit Tokyo within 10 days, and he's got an idea how to attract it to their trap. Koichi thinks that if they can get him a plane, he could drive Godzilla into the trap. Akitsu wonders if Koichi has a death wish, and Koichi doesn't deny it. Doc finds him a plane, but it's a special experimental plane that isn't quite assembled yet. The only mechanic that can fix it is Tachibana, the mechanic who remembers Koichi from the island. Koichi tells the mechanic that he wants to fly, that fly that plane right into Godzilla's mouth as a redemption for his previous failures. As the men get the ships ready, Akitsu points out to Doc that the men are facing certain death but they're happy to do it. This time, 
they'll make a difference. Not just Koichi, but all of them want some kind of redemption from the war. This time we're making it right. They tell young Mizushima that he can't go along because he hasn't seen war, and they want to protect him. He begs to go with them, but they won't budge. Watachibana well, shows Koichi that the plane is ready, and he's got a great big bomb built into it. It's a powerful kamikaze fighter. Tachibana lays on the guilt about Odo Island and the deaths Koichi caused, but he relents when he sees Koichi is really going to go through with it this time. He leaves little Akiko with Sumiko, along with the money he, all the money he has. He's not coming back. Sumiko gets a mysterious telegram not long after. What could be in that telegram? Godzilla enters the bay, and everyone starts to their parts of the plan. Godzilla gets up on land, and the plan requires him to be in deep water, so Koichi has to lure it back out to sea. This works surprisingly well, so Doc gets the ships in position. Godzilla does an atomic blast, but he shoots it at a decoy ship with nobody on it. Yeah, and then it takes him a while to recharge, so they're good for a few minutes. Doc says it, Doc says it takes time before he can shoot again, so they surround him with their ships and drop large Freon canisters, while Koichi continues to distract the monster. It's all very tense. They see Godzilla charging up for another blast, so they set off the Freon, which sinks Godzilla to the bottom of the ocean. Which doesn't kill him. Whoops. They then inflate the balloons, which floats Godzilla to the surface very quickly, but the crane breaks and they can't do much. Mizushima arrives with a whole fleet of tugboats. He gets to save the day after all. The tugs pull on the cables, forcing Godzilla right up to the surface. Godzilla is clearly badly injured from all this, but he's far from dead. And worse than that, he's not happy. Yep, and he's charging it up again. Yep, everyone on the ships has time to realize that they're about to die. Suddenly, Koichi dives down and flies right into Godzilla's mouth. The bomb goes off and Godzilla's entire head goes with it. Oh, it's dead. Mm -hmm. Then they all look up and see that Koichi has ejected. Surprisingly, we didn't know about this, but you can if you look close. Yeah, yeah. Tachibana it's, it's installed an ejector seat that we didn't know about. The atomic energy then breaks Godzilla's body apart, and he crumbles into the ocean. Upon returning to shore, they're all hailed as heroes. Sumiko is there, and he brings Koichi a letter. He and Akiro run to the hospital, where they find Noriko in bed. She's been in a coma, but she wasn't killed in the earlier attack. She got better. Yay! We then cut to the deep ocean, where we see bits of Godzilla down there, mutating. There's probably going to be... He's doing something. Every, every piece is going to grow to a new Godzilla. There'll oh, my. There'll be a thousand of them now. <laughs> well, this one has a lot of drama involving wartime tensions and recovery. It really is more about Koichi's story and redemption than it is about the monster. It spends the majority of the film dealing with post-war trauma and what the Japanese people really felt about the war after it had ended. They've all seen war, but this time it's different. For a giant monster movie, it's surprisingly emotional. Godzilla is more powerful than ever, and in this version, he's clearly an evil-minded monster. Yeah, he's an asshole. Yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> in some filmed versions, Godzilla is a sort of anti-hero. You know, he fights off the other monsters and protects Japan from its enemies. Not so much here. He's completely malevolent, seemingly enjoying crushing and blasting the human cities. And the ships. His atomic blast especially has been upgraded. You do not want to be anywhere near that thing. No, no you don't. Yeah, very, very good. Yeah. Academy Award for Visual Effects. Best of the Week. Yeah. Which brings us to... Best stop, of the Week. Let me look through motion. this list here. Oh, yeah, easily. Yeah. Brings us to Stop Motion. Directed by Robert Morgan, written by Robin King and Robert Morgan. Stars Aisling Franciosi, Stella Gonet, Tom York, Theric Wilson-Reed. One hour, 33 minutes. Uh, I think this one's on... Oh. Shutter, isn't it? Yeah, Shutter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The stop motion in this one is very cool. It's not a stop motion movie. It's a live action movie, but it's got stop motion bits she's, in it. She's making stop motion movies. Yeah, it's yeah. not a cartoon. So it's, it's a real. movie within a movie, kind of. The stop motion work that is in here is very cool and weird and interesting. The story itself is a little on the slow side and kind of predictable, but everyone in it is good and the dialogue seems natural. Overall, we rate it as... Not great, but above middling. <laughs> the effects are cool. Yeah. 
I think if it had been just a little bit shorter, we'd have been happy with it. Maybe, yeah. Well, we open on Ella Blake at a flashy dance club. And this is a new one, so we won't spoil roll. it to death. Yeah, we'll just give you a little taste. Well, later, we see Ella working to assemble a model of a little furry cyclops. They're almost cute. They're kind of cartoony. She takes a computer photo of it and moves it just a little bit before the next photo. She's making a stop-motion film. There's an older woman standing behind her giving her directions. And then we see a little bit of her film. Ah, it's not working, the old woman says. We need to do it again. The older woman is Stella, Ella's hypercritical mother. Stella's hands are all messed up with arthritis. She can't do the work anymore. So Ella is basically her hands. Afterward, Ella goes to see her boyfriend, Tom, and, and her friends, who are also, they're all artists and animators in the business. They go to his place, but Ella needs to get home before the old woman wakes up. Ella explains that she promised to help her mother finish this last film, but she doesn't feel confident in her ability to make one of her own. Well, in the morning, Ella's tired and cranky, and her mother gets demanding. The old woman has a stroke or something and winds up in the hospital. Ella imagines her mother laying on the floor, but she's just made of meat. Ella gets a new apartment for a studio, and she wants to finish her mother's film there. This, I wondered what this was about. They, the mother has a studio. Why didn't she just go to the mother's studio? I'm not sure. Yeah, wanted her own place for a fresh start, I think. I mean, it was not clear that the mother was going to die or wind up in a nursing home or anything. She Presumably, she could have got better and went home. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, she gets all set up, but gets distracted by a little girl who keeps singing in the hallway. Ella explains the whole process to the girl. And we get to see the whole process that way, too. She shows the uncompleted film to the girl with the cyclopses. And she says it's boring. The girl wants a better story. So she comes up with a whole story about a stalker taking, tasting a girl in the woods. And then after the girl leaves, Ella imagines herself in the woods being pursued. We see that some time has passed. And she's built up a forest set with a creepy little girl doll running from something. Tom, the boyfriend, says she's obsessed over the film and needs a break. Ella visits her mother in the hospital and then throws out the Cyclops set. She's going to move on and do her own. We shouldn't One more. read further. One you, more. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Polly, Tom's sister, comes over, wants to see Ella's film so far. What are you on? She asks when she sees the weird girl on the screen. The little girl neighbor complains that the wax girl doesn't look real enough and suggests using a real dead meat puppet, a piece of steak formed into a puppet. Well, Ella starts again with a new, even creepier model. This time they add a bad man who is chasing the girl in the film. He's the Ash Man, the man no one wants to meet. And that's a good stopping point there. Yeah, yeah it is. So, what's happening with this little cartoon thing she's making and how does it affect her real life and what's and it, real and what isn't? And it starts overlapping a little bit. She's got a really vivid imagination and this little girl is weird and keeps wanting to, you know, be part of the film too. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't dislike it at all. It's, but it's not quite great. Yeah. I, my, I think the moral of the story is all real artists really are crazy. She's a little bit crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and right away, as soon as the little girl started using meat, I kind of suspected that the little girl would turn out to be imaginary. I wondered about that. Is she that. real or is this just her imagination talking? And you do wonder. You do wonder. Yeah. And the film is mostly real, but it regularly cuts to the stop motion film that Ella is currently working on. And they're all very weird, but very well done. I'm surprised how smooth some of that is. Most of the stop motion I've seen in real life is kind of jerky. This is really well it's done. Really, yeah, yeah. They, I guess, you know, you can be more granular about it. I guess. Oh yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah clearly. After yeah. a while, the stop motion stuff starts breaking into the real world, and that's cool as well. The story, however, moves kind of slowly, and it really is very predictable. Not only that, but it's soon obvious that none of the. Well, okay, yeah. It, yeah, don't spoil yeah. that. Yeah, it, it, it's it's so, predictable. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably its biggest fault. It's worth seeing, though. It is. It is. It's, it's not great. It's no Godzilla minus but one, the visuals but it's are, good. Visuals are really cool, and yeah, overall would recommend. Yeah. 
And next up, we've got a graphic novel. Graphic novel, not a short this week. We don't read comic books regularly, but when people send them to us, hey, we'll take a look. Yeah, new works, if you got them out there and you want us to take a look. We've written a self-published book or a comic book or a graphic novel or especially the shorts, of course. Mm -hmm. Let us know about it. We'll take a look. We'll review. We're happy to review it. Yeah. If it's terrible, we won't say anything. <laughs> if it's good, we'll give it a plug. We won't rip it. We're not critics. We're reviewers, generally. Well, the, yeah, this for, one is, especially for new works and independent works. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, this one today is called Hemlock Avenue from 2024, written by Richard T. Wilson, our two artists, Pietro Vaughn and Shahid R. Uh, it's published by Mad Shelley Comics. It's 96 pages in black and white. There's a link in the show notes to where you can pick one up. Mm-hmm. And spoiler free, what happens? Well, spoiler free. Well, from the publisher. What's the publisher say? Let let me read this. Yeah. This is their quote. Uh, For some, Hemlock Avenue was just an old legend, a place on the town map that nobody could ever seem to find. But for those that did, their lives would never be the same. Once you've arrived, you'll meet your beautiful hostess, Elma a 30-something nurse who guides wayward souls to their well-earned rewards. Sometimes assisted by her young ghostly friend Charlotte, a Halloween girl, she offers these same lost travelers either second chances or the dark reckonings they so richly deserve. So if you find you've lost your way in the night and a stunning raven-haired nurse extends a hand, well, hang on to your hopes that it's only a nightmare. Yeah, and that whole richly deserves reward thing is kind of the theme for all the stories. Yeah, uh uh-huh. It's like a final judgment. Um, You know, they they decide which way things are going to go. Yeah. Well, the art in this one is hit and miss, I thought. The first story, Last Exodus, looks like it was drawn normally, you know, like maybe, I don't know, eight and a half by 11 sheets or something like that, and then made to squeeze or stretch into comic book frames. It's like they used a template and had to make the pictures fit. Yeah, so the art is, is really good, but yeah, that that is what it seemed like. like the, yes, many of the, the pictures are drew distorted. Up. They're too wide or yeah. too tall or and then, something. And then somebody decided, well, you know, they drew it this size, but it's got to fit the box this size, so they stretched it a bit. Yeah, it's a weird yeah. aspect ratio thing. It might be a stylistic choice. And it's not every frame. No? No, it's it's just some of them. But yeah. it's noticeable. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely noticeable. Yeah. It didn't work for me. But the art is really impressive, though. Yeah, it was good otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the two middle stories, Rose and Bus Stops and Bacon, both looked amazing. As good as comics get. A couple of them almost look photographic in quality. Mm -hmm. The fourth story, Free Range, also suffers from that stretchy frame problem. There were two artists involved in the book's making, and their styles are widely dissimilar. Yeah, I think the the second artist... You can tell who's who. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he draws just fine, but it doesn't come off well because of that weirdness. The stretchiness. Yeah. Yeah. The the artist for the middle two books, he's really good. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe the other guy is too. It's just harder to tell. Yeah, he didn't have the stretching issue. The stories are very are consistent, revolving about people getting what they deserve, for better or worse, depending on the characters and how they live their lives. A couple of them have happy endings. A couple of them uh, don't. Not so happy. Yeah. (laughs) The stories are pretty simple and straightforward, similar to the kind of stuff you would see in old EC comics. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh Overall, I did like it a lot. Yeah, we'd recommend it. Yeah. Again, follow that uh, that link in the show notes, and you can check it out for yourselves. Yes. All right. And I think they give a sample too on their on their page, if I remember right. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that takes us to our next film, Ghosts of War, from 2020, written and directed by Eric Bress, stars Brenton Thwaites, Kyle Gallner, Alan Richson, and Theo Rossi. Hour and 34 minutes. I saw the trailer for this and thought it looked awful. It was quite good. This was one starts out that fairly normal, starts out as a fairly normal seeing, seeming war movie and builds the weirdness and creepiness pretty nicely. And then it gets weirder from there. The cast, direction, effects, and other production ingredients were all very well done. We were pleasantly surprised, liking it more than we expected to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, watch that trailer, but then watch the movie anyway because it's better than you'd think. And we're not going to spoil this one either. No. Despite it being 2020, this is this one is one you should go into cold if you can. Yes. Just well, watch just watch the trailer and you know watch yeah. it. 
How does it start? Well, it's 1944 in Nazi-occupied France. A soldier wakes up to see a strange man standing in the shadows just outside camp. And he stealthily reaches for his gun as he's watching the guy, except the guy suddenly vanishes. And credits roll. Well, in the morning, the five soldiers continue their march. They see a jeep with some Nazis in it hit a mine, and they finish off the the occupants pretty viciously. They are marching to a headquarters that they need to hold until their relief comes. It's a pretty easy mission. They just, this uh, old uh, estate that they need to hang on to, like, you know, what could go wrong? Well, they pass a group of Jewish survivors out in the field, and one of the guy gives a mother some gold teeth he's collected from Nazis and an officer's coat. And when they get to the large building they're supposed to hold, the men they are leaving who are already guarding the place are really quite eager to leave. They, they, something's going on there, but they don't tell what. Well, the group, now alone, explores the huge house. They hear noises in odd places and track it down, but they don't find anyone else except some of the noises are in Morse code. It's a message saying, I have no legs. Well, Eugene finds a book that tells what happened to the Hellwigs, the family that used to live in the house before the Nazis came. And he finds a photo of them, which is empty when he looks again. Upstairs, Tappard is on sentry duty, and he sees some weirdness out in the garden. In the morning, no one really wants to talk about the strange things they saw last night. Eugene tells Chris and Kirk a story about how oddly violent Tappert can be. Tappert and Eugene go to the attic and find a sacrificial altar and a big, big pentagram on the floor. They soon come to the conclusion that the house is haunted. The radio says, if you leave, you die. Well, a bunch of German soldiers arrive outside, and there are only five inside to defend the place. The doors are locked, and the soldiers are ready to leave and move on, but there's a loud noise from upstairs. The Germans attack. There's a real live battle. Butchie is horribly injured, and in addition, the four remaining guys doing well, um, some of the Germans are killed by unseen ghosts. That's weird. Yeah. Should we stop there? Yeah, I think that's a good place. Yeah. So, so you got the pentagram upstairs, mysterious uh-huh. voices over the radio, ghosts but it that almost, kill Germans. It almost seems like the ghosts are good guys, maybe. maybe. Maybe it's the ghosts of the family, maybe. Or are they? Or are they? Yeah, this is a weird one. Yeah, it was cool. Okay, well, Tappert mentions that he saw Abbott and Costello meet the mummy, and also he mentions I was a teenage werewolf's, te- werewolf, two films that didn't come out until the 1950s. There's lots of other anachronisms here, too. But maybe that's not a mistake at all. Yeah, that, that was how this goes. Yeah. It starts up as a pretty normal war movie, but the creep factor builds up very quickly once they get to the house. It's got a decent budget, and it mostly looks pretty good. The acting is fine, the special effects are well done, and what happens later in the film is also really cool as well. It yeah. was much more, much better than we expected. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, definitely recommend it, especially if you're into the war kind of movies. Mm-hmm. And ghost movies, and yeah, big thumbs up. Another one that didn't go the way we expected is 2024's <laughs> Low Life, directed by Tesh... Plural, G- Low, Low Life. Low Life. Plural, yeah. This is on Tubi, so we were expecting it to be garbage. <laughs> well, sometimes they You are. know, straight to Tubi movies generally... Tend I, to tend to suffer a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, this was yeah. way better than we thought it was going to be. It was really good. Directed by Tesh Gudikanda and Mitch Oliver. Written by Al Kaplan. Stars Amanda Fix, Matthew McCall, Brenda Llewellyn, and Elise Levesque. Hour and 30 minutes. Trailer in the show notes. Spoiler free. What oh, oh, you're waiting for me. I'm oh. waiting for you. Oh, I'm just zoning out here. Yeah. Well, we were expecting something predictable, and it wasn't. It's well made with excellent realistic effects and a strong cast. We give it a big thumbs up, enjoying it much more than we expected to. Hey, if you watch the trailer, it's this family in an RV drives down the road. They run across these two hillbilly redneck types who get, act all creepy. And the next thing you see is they go to the house. and You think it's going to be a wrong turn situation or a hills have eyes kind of 
Yeah, you know, you know that, the redneck still in the, the of, yeah, yeah, the 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 clean cut American guys. Uh huh. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, it's more complicated than that. It is. <laughs> yeah. A limping man is pursued and murdered in the woods. He's dragged off as credits roll. Keith, Kathleen, and the family park their huge RV and do a cookout. It's the once a year family vacation, and Jeffrey and Amy aren't all that into it. A beat up pickup drives up, and two guys get out. They're looking for Melior. Billy and Vern are creepy, but they soon leave. The family eventually packs up and drives off in their RV. And I think Deliverance has already mentioned at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the two hillbillies flag the RV down a little bit later. Looks like their pickup is broken down. They ask for a ride, but the family is concerned, especially since Vern has a shotgun. Kathleen wants to drive on, but Keith allows Billy to come in for a ride. Jeffrey wants to play ad-libs, but Billy doesn't know what an adjective is. Billy looks at the ad-lib book and thinks the handwriting looks like maybe that's Melior's handwriting in there. Huh. Huh. And you should stop there. We should probably there. stop there, yes. Yeah. I'm like ten minutes in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, this does not go the way you expect. All right, let's and see. That's, and that's all we can tell you. <laughs> uh, commentary, commentary. Oh my goodness! Oh, all the commentary is spoiler filled. Well, we liked it. Let's it leave was, it at that. <laughs> it was better than we expected, and we liked it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not going to spoil it for you. No, I, I. Wow, there's not much we can say about this one. If you want to read about it in the newsletter or on the website, you can do so. Yeah, and horrorguys.com or horrorbulletin.com or has wanna, the full spoilery synopsis there. But we're not going to kill it for you guys. Tune into Tubi and watch it. Even better. Yeah. I like Tubi. It's free, and they've got. I think Tubi has more quantity of horror than anything else. It's pretty darn good. Netflix yeah. is pretty awful with the horror. Mm-hmm. Shutter used to be good, but they've the, gotten worse and worse. The downside is commercials. We've come full circle back to commercial television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not much you can do about that at this point. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. If you'd like to read about the Human Monster, an oldie starring Bella Lugosi from 1939. Which was pretty good, I thought. Yeah, it was. More of a crime drama, kind of low on the horror elements. Kind of technically he's a mad scientist and he's killing people, but why? Yeah. And 1960s The, the Leech Woman, where a, an aging beauty queen wants to get young by doing bad things. And boy, she plays a good villain. <laughs> yeah, thought she was really good in the role. Yeah, they're, they're both good ones. They're both worth watching. Mm-hmm. And you can check those out over at horrorbulletin.com. Uh, check out hourlongpress.com if you'd like to pick up that free book on wildfires. It's free until Tuesday, every week, new one. Nice. Next week, we've got uh, another horror biography coming out next Wednesday, I think. Who haven't we covered? Ooh, I know, I know. He's 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 small and strange. He's and he, small? And he played. Well, he was on the small side. <laughs> I don't know how to... He was a diminutive guy. Was he? Yeah, I believe so. Well, his son was huge. Are we talking about the same guy? I don't know. We are, are we? talking about the same guy. Oh. You're talking about Peter Laurie. He um, came out a couple oh, of weeks oh, ago. Oh, Peter Laurie <laughs> already came out. Okay. No, Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney. Senior. The yes. old Lon Chaney. Yes, he was He was a, a fine fellow. He was the man of a thousand faces. I don't know if fine fellow really fits right, <laughs> according to the stories from uh, Junior. Yeah, it's iffy. Okay, but yeah, this week is the wildfires. Next week, we're going to talk about Lon Chaney. Well, we're not going to talk about him, but you can get the free book starting Wednesday. If you'd like to be notified when that book is released for Lon Chaney, go over to OurLongPress.com, sign up for the newsletter there, all these newsletters. Mm -hmm. And once a week, Friday morning, you'll get an email saying, hey, this is our book for the week. It's free. You can click on it and get the free book, or you can skip it if it doesn't interest you at the time. But it's just one email a week. We do not want to pile on spam to people. Horrorbulletin.com, one newsletter a week with a whole bunch of reviews in it. Hourlongpress.com, one letter a week with one free book in it. Nice. I, I like free hate books. spam. But I love free books. Free stuff is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this is it for this week. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And we'll see you when? Next week. See ya. See ya. See ya.